done, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming back. It's always a difficult session straight after lunch, so uh, I appreciate that. A um, bit, bit like Tom said earlier on, I also started my forestry career in this building uh, as a student walking through those doors 20-something years ago. I'll let you do the maths. Um, so my presentation is going to be a little bit different. Uh, <clears throat> I describe myself as a, as a generalist, as a, as a forester. I've had a breadth of experience, uh, most of it operational. Um, so uh, not so much um, graphic content that we've seen uh, already this morning. Um, so uh, what I'm doing is sharing a lot of my observations, things I've seen, uh, linking it back to climate change, uh, <clears throat> and then bringing that back to some of the work that we're doing in NRW. So uh, I'm yeah, Sinjin Ashworth, Timber Sales and Marketing Manager for NRW. Um, as I say, I've been around uh, for quite a while. Um, uh, got grey hair to to prove it as well. Sorry, wrong way. So a little bit about the Welsh Government Woodland Estate, the bit that I help with the management of. So 123,000 hectares currently. Um, most of it is productive high forest, of course. We do have uh, other uh, activities on the estate, wind energy. But uh, that gives us 40% of the Welsh forest resource and the largest land manager in Wales. So we estimate, uh, uh, and I can source this in in the document here, the purpose of and role of the Welsh Government Woodland Estate, about 21.2 million cubic metres of standing timber currently. So that puts us as the largest supplier of certified timber in Wales, and we've got uh, 620,000 tonnes harvest at the moment. Roughly, it's a bit more than 60% currently of the, the market share. So to manage our woods, uh, and I'm going to talk a, a little bit of focus on harvesting as I go through. Um, we uh, put all the timber out for sale. We follow a standing sale model. We do some roadside contracts as well, very little nowadays. Uh, but that gives us 200 uh, plus individual commercial contracts to manage. And when I say manage it, you know, it's dead easy, isn't it? We just put the stuff out on tender and people buy it. We've got a bit of compliance and a few hoops we have to jump through to make sure uh, at the end of the day, the uh, the timber is a public asset and it's up to us to account for it in the best way possible. So you'll you'll notice I deliberately haven't put any carbon claims in these figures, especially with Robert in the room, uh, in case it gets challenged. Uh, but we're also holding uh, a, a carbon resource which is accounted for through Welsh Government as well. So in terms of the ownership of the carbon, it's definitely state carbon there. So this isn't my uh, Tesco club card barcode here. This is the, you've all seen this before, Professor Ed Hawkins, show your stripes. Uh, it just shows us, we've already heard this morning, temperatures increasing, the climate is changing. So uh, my, my start in this little world was kind of uh, just around 1980 honest uh, and at that point you know I've seen the change as I'm sure you all have in the room you've seen the change of climate how things have got more difficult so we, we accept that we know that as an industry we know things are changing um, uh, government uh, has sponsored the independent assessment of UK climate risk and within that document if you haven't already read it I'd suggest it's worth having a look through so within that document they've identified uh, the risks to um, to the UK um, they've broken those risks down into country and into sector as well. Uh, so they've made some recommendations in here of the bits that we need to mitigate for. So again, I've, I've stolen uh, a picture out of that document. Uh, it really just outlines the land use pressure. Um, uh, so this is part of the forestry briefing in terms of sector briefing. Uh, I've shared this with customers before. You may have seen some, some, you've heard me talk about this before. So there's four areas where more action is needed in our sector and two that require further inv investigation. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm repeating the same message you've already heard this morning. So it's about uh, moisture deficit. It's about pest and disease, soil health, wildfire. These are all uh, threats. So they're all things that we're going to see further instances of as we go through. So here's a, again, I've uh, I pinched this off Forest Research. So they've made an assessment of what's going to happen in Wales. Uh, it's already happening. Summers are going to be warmer. Winters will be milder. 
rainfall distribution will change, drier summers, increased frequency of drought, increased frequency of high intensity rainfall. We're having some of that today. Um, uh, we've also lost opportunities for uh, frost, and that's an opportunity and a threat to us. And I'll come on to why that's the case in a minute. It's likely we're going to have more wind events, so more uh, Atlantic storms, more disruption. Um, we've all, in recent memory, in the last five years, the UK has experienced several wind events that's caused significant disruption. Uh, and that gives me, as a timber sales and marketing manager, a real headache, something to think about. And it's something we need to be prepared for. So I just wanted to bring this back to harvesting a bit. That's what I promised I'd talk about today. And, and um, I'm, I'm not here to, to preach. I'm not here to give you uh, examples of how you should be harvesting. That's not what I'm intending to do. But I just want to share some of the pressures that we have on the Welsh Government Woodland Estate in terms of uh, trying to manage harvesting. So we've got a, a road network of um, about 3.7 thousand kilometres of forest road. Um, that road network is old. Uh, we've been building it up over 100 years. It, so they, all those roads were built to a standard um, and uh, it, it was a standard of vehicle. Uh, so vehicles have got bigger. Um, we're moving timber in a much shorter space of time. So the pressure on our road network currently is, uh, is unbelievable. So as I say, 22,000 HGB movements a year. Um, that's the out. That's the dispatches. Obviously, those lorries have to come in as well, so you could almost double that. Uh, also, uh, uh, we have a history of drainage in the forest industry. We like to get in the past. We got the water away from site as quick as we physically could. Um, as a result of that, we now have a network of drainage. Um, we have culverts going underneath roads and we have drains that uh, fast, uh, flow as fast as possible into the nearest river uh, and away. Um, on reflection, that's not great. We know that that's uh, that's a weakness now. Uh, so I've, there's a couple of pictures there. One thing I've observed is our culvert crossings uh, probably not fit for purpose uh, for this the peak storm flow. We're seeing quite frequent washouts. Um, we're seeing quite a few landslips from where we're holding too much water behind culvert head uh, head walls. Um, so we've still got some work to do. It's obviously very expensive. Engineering's got very expensive, especially in the last two years. Um, inflationary pressures on that. Um, we've also got the Water Framework Directive. And what that directive demands is that we uh, we should be disconnecting these uh, drainage systems, uh, removing them from the water course, removing that potential for pollution. Problem with that, that costs money again. And, and as I said, we've got 3,700 kilometers to do. So it's a it, it's a big task. One of the things, one of the results of that uh, is that to disconnect those water courses and those drains, we have to discharge that water somewhere. Uh, at the moment, we're discharging those water into the near, nearest crop. Uh, these reverse J drains. Um, obviously, we change the hydrology on that crop. Then it makes it more difficult for harvesting when we come in to do thinning. When we come in to do clear fell, we've now got a very wet site that was uh, that was previous previously dry. So anyone involved in harvesting, this next one will be familiar to you. Summer harvesting. Uh, summer harvesting is no longer a guarantee of, of good weather. Uh, we're seeing that more and more frequently now. Um, we're also, we know that we're gonna have an increased risk of siltation from a diffuse pollution. Um, our soils are drier in the summer. We then have a big storm event and it picks up that that top layer, that dust, and, and it's gone within within hours. Increased risk of wind blow on our sites as well. So that's uh, the, the do nothing. We're getting more sporadic wind blow, but also during operations. So thinning operations where we think we have a stable crop, all of a sudden we'll have one of these wind events and it'll cause us uh, more problems with the harvesting. It'll increase the cost. Worse than that, it makes it more dangerous for our contractors going in. I touched on it already, the benefit of frost conditions. There was in the past where we have a period of long frost, uh, it was usually an opportunity for us to get onto wet ground when it was frozen. Um, we no longer have that opportunity. 
so another uh, period in the calendar that we've lost for certain operations. There's a reason I'm sharing all this with you. So again, I just I just wanted to share um, some again some of my observations more than anything. Um, I'm a generalist. I don't have the data to back this up, uh, but these are the things I've seen, and I'm sure you have already in the woods. So in terms of forest species, we're seeing changes in behaviour already in the woods. Um, so our scheduled one nesting birds, uh, they uh, to give them the room to nest so we're not disturbing. That's a, we're a requirement in law. Um, so we stay away, but unfortunately that period is growing. Um, that could be anywhere now from an early nesting period in in uh, late January all the way through till September. Um, and I'm not aware of any evidence in the UK yet, but over in Europe there is evidence that scheduled one uh, nesting birds are uh, multiple brooding, so second broods, which is extending that exclusion period again. We've got to be alert to migratory species, so this change in behaviour for those migratory species, the ospreys. Um, uh, there's evidence again on the continent that some of these migratory species with a climate change it are no longer migrating. They don't need to. Um, so some of our winter visitors, some of our summer visitors might be a regular fixture here, which again, if they're on the scheduled list, is going to cause us some further problems for harvesting. Uh, we've got ecological refugees as well. So this is where we end up with isolated species. Uh, they can no longer function uh, where they were, so they've they are now roaming. They are trying to find uh, new places to live. Uh, we've already uh, touched on Ips, so you could argue Ips is a, an ecological refugee. It's now looking for a better climate, um, which uh, at the moment it seems like south of England uh, they're quite enjoying it down there. Uh, changing threats. Um, Again, already touched on it, the epidemic endemic threats, threats of pests and disease. Now I'm bringing that into a harvesting scenario here um, because obviously we have a finite contractor resource, the guys that do the work for us. Uh, they can't be everywhere at the same time. So whenever we have a big wind event, whenever we have a, a, an epidemic uh, and we get issued plant health notices, we have to clear up quickly. It just stresses that contractor resource. Um, I'm going to get shot for putting this one in, but I've listed regulation as a as a threat. Um, it is also an opportunity, um, but I put that in because of sometimes our regulation has unintended consequences on our operations. So good intent, uh, direction from Europe or, or, or the UK, good intent, but actually it causes us further problems down the line. Uh, catastrophic wildfire. Last year we saw the biggest forest fire I think we've experienced in NRW uh, down in South Wales. That is estimated to cost us millions of pounds to put right. Um, that's lost production and, and of course lost carbon very quickly. Uh, these repeated wind events as well. Uh, again, we can no longer rely on our prevailing winds coming, coming from the southwest. Um, they're coming from everywhere now, and, and it tends to be the other winds that knock our crops down. I thought it's worth mentioning as well, change in society to climate change and what's happening there. Um, as the uh, public sector forest resource, um, you know, our, one of our biggest stakeholders is the public Cymru, uh, the people in Wales. Uh, so with a warming climate, we're seeing repeated visits to our woods. Uh, which is excellent, that's what we want to see. But with that comes the extra pressure for car parking, comes the pressure on harvesting specifically. We get a lot of um, people wandering into harvesting sites. We're having to slow down operations. We're having to fit around peak periods, bank holidays, school holidays, etc. In terms of community as well, uh, uh, particularly more in South Wales, we're seeing there's a, a lower tolerance to harvesting uh, uh, it, harvesting activity now. Uh, it's usually haulage related. We're pushing lots of timber, big trucks through communities, um, down narrow roads. Um, and as a result of that, that lower tolerance, we have the bad end of, uh, of the spectrum with the antisocial behaviour. Uh, so yeah, motorbikes, theft, uh, parties, raves, fires, um, uh, I feel climate. it's worth mentioning because it, if we're going to have a warming climate, better, warmer summers, I think there's going to be more antisocial activity in our woods. 
So what, what are we going to do about it? I've, I've painted a pretty bleak story about how hard harvesting is. Um, so I think we have to be alert to this as an industry. Uh, we don't have enough contractors to go round. They can't all be in the same place at the same time. Uh, so I think we need to optimise a bit better than we are currently, uh, rather than just pumping out uh, coops for sale uh, to deliver a forest resource plan. I think we need to think about the work schedules a bit. Uh, I do have a solution from that for the public forest estate, which I'll come on to in a minute. I think our working methods probably we need to be a bit more agile. So we need to be ready to move, ready to respond. Uh, if if site A is no longer suitable, we need to be ready to move on to site B straight away. So there's no downtime. Um, that's quite hard to do with the way as a public sector, we currently sell our contracts. We sell individual contracts. Um, so what I'm saying is we might be part of the issue here. Um, so equally, we could be part of the solution as well. So appropriate silvicultural practices. One thing that I was I was thinking this morning when we were looking at the some of the alternative species. Um, when it comes to harvesting, Sitka spruce is great because it comes with a nice brash resource as well that we can use for environmental protection um, when we come to do the harvesting operation. So it's one thing to consider when we're looking at alternative species. They might be silver culturally appropriate, uh, but they might be causing us another problem down the road when we come to harvest. So I, I also, our processing sector. So these are the these are the guys that really um, fund uh, our activity into, through the timber sale receipts. So these are the customers uh, processing wood. Um, so I think uh, on occasion where we have these extreme wind events, uh, I spend a lot of my time uh, having to justify extending commercial contracts <clears throat> uh, to allow customers to come back in and pick, pick timber up. Um, we've had a washout. The roads collapsed. We need to repair a road. A bird's turned up. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I, I would, I would throw the challenge out to the processing sector really, and and say maybe we need to have a think about contingency, uh, and that includes alternative stock control. So somewhere else we can store the wood rather than leave it standing. <clears throat> Harvesting resource capacity, uh, and I'm I'm talking here about skills as well as machinery. Um, it, it is a finite resource and it is currently shrinking um, and we need it to be going the other way. So we need to be building that. Um, that's difficult. That has to come through investment. Um, and so without the timber, we, we don't get the investment. I suppose what I'm trying to say is we need, uh, there's a risk here. We need to keep this whole, this um, timber industry moving to keep the income moving and keep that investment flowing. Uh, innovation is what we're doing today. Um, we're, we're, we're here talking about uh, new things, new ideas. Um, I think science will bring some of that innovation out for us, but also operationally, I think we need to be a bit more innovative with the way we harvest trees. Um, some things being discussed at the moment, explosive felling uh, as, an, as an alternative on steep grounds and da with dangerous trees. Um, uh, but also, uh, like I said, where we store wood and how we store it. Uh, the contractor base as well, very heavily dependent on fossil fuels currently. Um, it's it's uh, quite machine intensive, uh, very keen to decarbonise that and also the haulage operation. Um, so I think that's one adaptation that's coming already with hydrogen cells and uh, and also with electric vehicles. Uh, there's some hybrid harvesters available on the market. Uh, so that's already happening. Knowledge transfer, what we're doing today. This is great if we've sowed a little seed in everyone's mind today, uh, today something you could take away and think about tonight and, and uh, employ in your everyday work. Uh, and and I've, I put this last one in here about land use competition. So it, it, the land, land in Wales is a finite resource. <laughs> we felt that through the discussions on the sustainable farming scheme. Um, it, there's a lot of pressure on everybody that owns land. And I think there's probably we need to have some challenging conversations there about what is the best use of a piece of land, whether it be forestry, agriculture, industry. I, I put this graph up <clears throat> um, just so I didn't feel left out because we looked at a lot of graphs already, so I felt I needed to put one in. 
Uh, but this graph we're looking at, this is the uh, how the pattern of dispatches from the Welsh Government would understate. It's fairly typical. This was from last year. But the grey line that you can see at the top there shows the flow. So each bar is a month of the year. You'll see we've got a dip in the middle. So we we see this every year. There is a dip during the summer. Um, bearing in mind everything I've just said about the challenges we have with scheduled one birds, with water and wind, it would be great if we could smooth that chart out. Um, now this this uh, this dispatch pattern is repeated across the industry. It's not just Wales. We see this in England uh, and on, on a UK level as well. There's, there's there's lots of reasons for that, but I just want you to uh, hold that thought for now, um, because I'm going to try and explain what we're going to do in NRW to try and address this gap and to try and smooth out that chart. So that brings me on to alternative methods of timber sale. We're committed in our timber sales and marketing plan to look at alternative methods of sale. Uh, we're making progress. It's not as fast as I'd like, but we are making progress. At the moment, 70% of our volume, we, we sell through conventional timber sales. So that's an EU auction. We sell to the highest bidder. Uh, the other thing, just reflecting on this morning, is we also sell... Uh, we sell by weight. The whole industry is based around sale by weight. So moving forward, bearing in mind we're trying to get as much as we can into uh, into the, the the place where our timber can do the best work. Um, sale by weight might not be the most appropriate mechanism. But for now, 70% uh, will remain through uh, conventional tender sale. We're introducing mine and produce sales. Uh, this is a response uh, partly from the uh, guys managing the estate that they often have remnant parcels of timber. You might have seen them growing moss as you grow around. Uh, it, it's it's wasteful, not not really that keen on it. Tends to be the last remnant bits of timber off a, off a commercial site. So we're gonna make these available, gonna be available to all. Uh, they're gonna be small parcels. Uh, what we're hoping is that this will incentivize some third sector and community groups to come in and buy some timber, uh, buy some timber from us. So the most exciting uh, alternative method uh, that we're likely to see this year is progressive sale opportunities. So this is where we are going to open up multi-year contracts. Uh, that it's not a new phenomenon. Phenomenon. Uh, we've done um, long-term contracts before, so these will be medium-term contract. But what we're trying to do this time is enable the change um, uh, and get some investment through the continuity of, of supply of that contract. So trying to get some of the changes that I mentioned before um, on the back of a longer term contract. That will give that contract holder uh, and us as a grower uh, that agility that we're after in the, in the program. So it means we can move machines quite quickly from one site to another. We can have several sites open uh, at one go. Uh, so I think that secures our program, um, but also secures uh, that stock for the for the customer. Um, the other thing about those progressive sale opportunities is we are going to try and incentivize some change for uh, People Planet Prosperity. So this triple P approach um, is is where we're trying to encourage customers to apply some improvements to people, pl planet, and prosperity through those contracts. Um, so some of those examples, uh, planet might be some of the hybrid harvesting equipment that I talked about. Um, some of the people bit might be training and apprenticeships to try and grow the sector a little bit. Uh, but those progressive sale opportunities, that that's the key difference between that and what we've done in the past those opportunities will have some incentives behind them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> another alternative method of sale we've been working on, we're not, we're not quite there yet, but one we're pilot, piloting at the moment is designated supply contracts. So uh, as a grower, we're in position of, we're holding a resource of timber. We'd like to encourage the sector to use that timber in the best possible way. Now, we're not sure what that is yet in terms of best possible way. Um, some of the work that Gail's been doing on timber industrial strategy will point us in, in the direction we need to go. <clears throat> but it's likely we'd like to see as much homegrown timber going into construction uh, as we can. 
Uh, to do that, we might need to revisit our silvicultural methods. So we'll also revisit the species, but maybe the silvicultural methods we're doing to get the strongest, best benefit from that fibre that we're growing in the estate. So th that designated supply contract um, is very much, a, you know, tree to table, seed to saw, however you want to brand it. <coughs> um, some of the problems we're having with those contracts are very technical, but it's it's around we're not in a position to influence markets. It'd be illegal for us to do so. We'd get in trouble. Um, so we're just trying to find a compliant way of, of making this change without influencing the market. So I, before I hand over to Andy for the next talk, I just wanted to leave you with a summary. Uh, so seasonally, it's become become less difficult for us to plan our harvesting. It's getting really challenging. Um, I know we've got some customers in the room that you'll have experienced this. Um, we're going to have to change the way we do things. That's probably a message you've heard from everybody this morning already, that we can't carry on with the way we're doing it because we know it won't work. So with the climbing, uh, climbing, uh, changing climate, we're going to have to do something uh, different. So we've got a, a role as professionals as well, just to increase the awareness of the impacts of uh, any of our changes that we're going to make. Uh, and as I say, if you could just remember that impact assessment, don't think about the first change, have a think about the online, uh, the downline uh, impacts of those changes. Uh, one last thing I want to leave you with is please, uh, a little professional plea from me, consider the end use of the timber when you're considering the, the management practices. Uh, in your crops. Uh, it's something I'm trying to influence now uh, through forest resource plans, uh, but it's just, uh, you know, are we chasing cubic meters of timber or are we chasing quality construction timber? And I think as an industry, we need to decide that. Um, so, uh, yeah, very similar to Robert, uh, adaption comes from trial and error. So I would say do something. It might not be right, but it doesn't matter. Do something do something different because uh, that's the only way we're going to get the change. Okay, thanks for listening. Good afternoon all. Uh, thank you very much for letting me have a little talk today. And I think from what Sinjin said, what Robert said, hopefully I'll, I'll have a similar message as well with some of those uh, points about acting. I think that, that they're quite key messages, I think, that I think we need to take away from today. So my name's Andy Wright. Uh, uh, I'm, I think it was what Robert said, if you're a senior, you must be old. That's me. I'm a senior specialist advisor within the land stewardship team within NRW. And what that means is I'm uh, um, part of the central service function that supports the place teams that actually deliver the stuff, which then goes to the likes of Sinjin for, for marketing. Um, so some of the things I may not know the answer to, thankfully today, we've also got people like, like Sinjin. So if people ask questions and, and we've got others from NRW who may be able to answer questions that I may not know because I'm in that central area as well. And what I play aim to do is just add some perspective um, to some of the stuff you've already heard today about how we are managing our land and how we're managing it in the future as well. Like Robert, I'm afraid to say my, the, the slides are not working in the in the, the links, so, so that was a shame. Uh, what, I, what I actually had there, that's a picture. It's actually on the A5 coming into Bexicoid. Um, the one underneath was the current, what it looks like today, which um, uh, well, I was going to show you first, but it's not working. That, I was just going to put some perspective there of, of, of um, change and how we need to le allow time for things. Um, so this this was about 1960, 65, um, and and the one underneath would show a wonderful what I call typical forestry landscape. And I know it's a poor quality black and white, but uh, you can still still see that there's parts of that. It's young crops, new 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 and challenging um, scenarios. And and with time of sixty years. That is a wonderful landscape now, and it's a shame I can't show that photo. Um, you will see it on the on the one when, when it's circulated around. The other thing I was going to mention as well, um, what we're thinking about here, what's been mentioned, is climate change, and I and I do think 
um, this buzzword of climate change that we talk about. And, and, and really, I think the last five, six, seven years, the, there's had been quite a, um, uh, a significant push on adapting and managing for climate change as if it's a new thing. And I think, oh, yes, this new thing of climate change. And I do go back to sort of some of the stuff that I remember at university. And, and um, was it Canels um, did, a, did a paper on UK forestry in the changing climate and a review of, of the impacts in 1989. And I just think it's taken us 35 years to get to the point where we go, yes, it's happening and we need to do something. And we are, we're actually way behind the curve and we should have been doing this 25 years ago when the ICF were running their um, uh, um, seminars up in Edinburgh as well. Um, so I just want to put a bit of scene, so similar to what um, uh, Sinjin has sort of said, um, although I'm going to go slightly wider um, for, for, for NRW, um, a few key facts. So we manage 7% of Wales. Um, so that gives us a unique privilege, and, and I think one that we shouldn't underestimate. 123,000 hectares, Sinjin's mentioned, is the Welsh Government Woodland Estate, but we've also got over 10,000 hectares of national nature reserves. So that's sand dunes, it's mountains. I always think of the fact that we actually manage Cadaridris as, as an organisation. It fits within our land stewardship remit. So we've got mountains, we've got moorlands, the Berwins, places like that. So we have a very diverse portfolio of land to manage. Um, so... And I think Singe has already mentioned sort of the, sort of the, the, the volumes. Uh, that is a, a big volume. And I think the, the mentions at the bottom, I, I'm not afraid to use the carbon figure. And I think um, that's probably one of Robert's figures anyway. The 26 million tonnes of carbon is stored in the Welsh Government Woodland Estate. But I think one of the key bits, which I'll come on to, is 84% conifer, 16% broadleaves, which is quite an interesting stat on its own. So these are just sort of setting the scenes of what we've got. I thought I'd sort of now talk about the drivers for, for managing our estate as well. And if you're not aware, NRW launched its corporate plan last year. And I think, my personal view, it's a groundbreaking corporate plan because it's actually fairly straightforward. It's got three objectives in the corporate plan. Nature's recovering. Communities are resilient to climate change and we're minimising pollution. It's very simple. Um, so uh, that's that's our focus of what we should be doing, those three areas. Um, I've highlighted a few of the um, actions. There's some action points in the plan as well that are relevant um, purely to sort of the woodlands that we manage and for trees uh, as well. So they're just a few points. I'm not going to go through them. They're just there just so you, you can sort of see them as well. Um, but that is what drives the direction that we should be going. And I think that's a very clear plan on what we should be doing. But we still have a multi-purpose forestry estate. We, we're, not, we're not managing solely for one thing. Um, I know we've been talking about timber uh, this morning, but when you're managing land, no, no, no land manager is solely managing for one thing. Um, we're always managing for multiple things, whether it's economics, whether it's tree growing. There's always going to be other things that come in there as well. So just flagging up that for us, we've got wind farms, we've got people, we've got recreation. Um, we've got to make money because um, we may be a government um, sponsored body, but that timber that we grow offsets the cost of running um, our land as well. So we've got to take that into account. Um, and, and try and work out what our conflicting priorities are with all that as well. But hopefully, and uh, due to uh, the trains not getting us here on time, I didn't hear Gail's um, session this morning, um, which was a shame because I really wanted to hear that one. But, but Gail's, Gail's document that I put back up here again, Adapting the Forest for, for woodland, um, for, and Woodland Management for Climate Change, it's not, I wouldn't say it's groundbreaking in some ways, because we already know a lot of these things, but it puts it into one place. We can all go, ah, right, yes, yeah, just a reminder. That's what you've got to do. That's what you've got to do. That's what you've got to do. All these things. And it gives you that little impetus to, to, to give some direction. And I flagged up a few of the points that are in there that particularly we're focusing on, on the estate. 
So species diversity. And, and uh, was it Chris that put up um, something on sort of some, some diversity in Wales, particularly the public forest estate, the NRW estate as well? Um, I actually just put this, put some of the data through sort of um, a formula that forest research come up with called the, well, I, don't, I don't think they came up with it, but they advertise it, the Shannon Index, to see whether, whether um, we are, are we, have we got some sort of diversity? Are we going the right direction? So the top figure of this, this chart, the index itself, shows that we are improving our diversity index as well. And the graph is the breakdown of our areas that we've got of where we're improving. And not surprisingly, um, if you know the Welsh Government Wooden Estate, our my, most diverse areas um, are the southeast, the Y Valleys, the Monmouthshires, where the ancient woodland sites are. And and probably didn't need an index to tell me this. And the least diverse are the more commercial aspects of mid Wales. Um, that's not a problem for us. It's just giving us that indication of, of where we're going. Are we going the right way? I think one of the worrying things that's already been shown as well from, from an estate is this shows our, our dominance as well of sort of the maximum percentage of dominant species. So 52% of, of dominant species. Oh, well, that's okay. We've dropped that now to 50% dominant species, primarily Sitka spruce. Um, so our, our, we are we are reducing our reliance, but are we reducing it quick enough? Um, so, and I think, and, and so something similar, but in a different way, was shown this morning. So this this graph shows the the, the sort of the, the slight reduction we've had in conifers uh, over the last 15 years. Uh, interestingly, it shows the reduction in larch is the light blue. Um, and when we do this for 2025, that will be a, probably a lot smaller again as well. Um, so I'd like to think that we're going to really sort of start increasing some of those other species in there to get some more of that diversity in there as well. On the broadleaf side, that shows a nice increase as well. Um, both the species, the, the number of different species, these are just some of the key ones and um, it also grouped as well, but shows over the last 15 years, the number and the diversity is increasing as well. So, so that's a, sort of one of the things to think about. But what we also should be thinking about, we've already mentioned this, whether they're called novel species, emerging species, whatever it is that we, we're calling them, we should be thinking about planting other stuff that, that we're not used to planting. And, and I was talking earlier with, with a colleague, and we should just be doing it. It's acts now. Um, uh, th there's enough information out there. Just uh, we should just be acting. Um, finally, I just thought putting all those those two informations together on one graph. That's the sort of the the ratio of conifers to broadleaves uh, across the NRW managed estate. Um, so the conifers are going down, um, and the broadleaves are going up. But is it going quick enough? Are we managing it? And the quickly enough is, yeah, our, our, should we change our whole philosophy of, of managing? We currently fell between one and one and a half percent of the forest estate per year. That's a sustainable cut. Nicely written in UKFS, Arquos and all of that. But we are challenged, and it was mentioned to, uh, earlier about the Sitka spruce that we've got. Um, are, we, are, we, are we diversifying it quickly enough? You are hampered by that one percent that we're felling. If you want to change... The, Certainly tables, rather than things on the ground, what we see, um, for it to show on a table, you'd have to increase the felling as well. Do we want to do that? Actually, are we physically capable? Sinja mentioned the, the issues over contractors. Have we got enough staff? Could we do any of that? Or can the mills take it? But it's a, it's a thought. And I, go, I would just say some of these are my views, not NRW's views as well. But moving on to structural diversity, that one's a harder one for us to actually quantify. Are, are we getting, so species is fine, we can do that. The Shannon Index helps us with a sort of badged sort of type approach. But structural diversity for us, how do we demonstrate that we are becoming structurally diverse? Um, and I like to flag up, I was out with, with James, wherever he's gone, um, and for, he's at the back there. I was out with James last week and forest research at the Kokainog. Um, uh, CCF trial site 
and, and it's, if you've never been there, it's a wonderful um, example used as a case study in the climate change stuff from, from forest research. Uh, that's one example of some of the CCF we, we are doing, but we need to be doing more of our, of our CCF uh, for various reasons or low impact silvicultural systems, whatever we want to call it. OK, and the way we're going to start thinking about doing that is we've got we've got us just in thin the woodlands. That's what we should be doing, th doing more thinning at an earlier stage um, um, rather than going at year 30 and starting thinning. We should be going in there at year 15 or 20 with some of our crops and, and really thinking about it and giving you the options for the future. I would also add clear felling should we, I, I can't see clear felling disappearing as a as a silver cultural tool for us. Um, it has a place, um, and, 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 and I know some people would like to see sort of the whole estate as CCF, but I think there's a place for, for, for clear felling as well. And so on, on a sort of trying to sort of put sort of some sort of way of de demonstrating our structural diversity, because it's all to do with the way that we have hold our data, really, some of it. Uh, I just thought I'd put this slide up. It shows that the average age of our conifers is uh, 37. Um, and it, it really shows quite a, a peak in that, that, certainly that young age, at zero to, to 30. The bulk of our, our crops are in that area as well. So that's where we should be focusing on um, providing that greater flexibility for management in the future. And, but interestingly enough as well, the broadleaves really show a very young age for our broadleaves. That goes back to our species diversity that we were doing. So that's just the age structure. Um, but because we, over the last 15 years, we're doing a lot more work on broadleaf planting, hence a lot more younger broadleaves as well on the estate. It's already been mentioned uh, a number of times. Um, events um, that uh, can also influence our, our um, management. Uh, and, and I've got a few that I, I wanted to touch on. So wildfire. and Cindy's already mentioned the Climate Change Committee's Risk Assessment 3 just reiterates again the impacts of wildfire. And last year, um, uh, we actually, I've uh, got to be careful how I word this because Fire and Rescue Service don't mind really wording it this way, but hey, if you looked at the national data for fires, last year wasn't a bad year for wildfires um, by, by the Fire and Rescue Standard. They don't like that figure because it's just purely on numbers rather than severity. For NRW, it was one of our biggest wildfire seasons ever. Uh, we had 50 odd fires and crucially, um, some of those occurred all at the same time. All in South, nearly all in South Wales, all stretching the, the, the fire and rescue service and our local teams during those time periods. This year, thankfully, the, uh, it's, been, it's been a very wet spring um, and We've not had, well, we've had two, two fires so far this year um, and, and nothing to write home about. That is going to be a big factor in the future. And we really need to factor this in a lot more, particularly in the high risk sites. We need to go back to fire belts, which we used to be larch in the old days. Um, we obviously can't use larch, but we need to restructure the woodland. So that's part of the plans in some of those high risk sites is, is actually putting um, actually probably broadly fire belts back in to our woodlands. But also we need to manage our fuel loads as well, i.e. The, the grassland. Because uh, if you haven't realised that fire, the wildfires, historically we've had fires for decades, centuries. That's, they've always happened. But they've normally been a winter and spring thing. But we're, what we're now seeing is we're getting them in summer. Um, and summer fires are much more intense. And a good example of that would be the fires uh, in England in 2018, which burnt houses um, as well. So wildfire is a big thing that's sitting on the radar for us that we've got to change our management techniques as well. So we've got to factor all these things in. And already mentioned um, extreme, extreme events. Uh, I, I get concerned about um, these extreme events and wind blow is definitely a big one for me I think um, we've been lucky so there's been a number of storms in the last five years that have significantly impacted um, Scotland and England particularly North England and, and West uh, East Scotland um, we've been lucky we have had wind blow some some reasonable scale, scale wind blow but nothing like that catastrophic um, but if we got a catastrophic wind blow 
how would we manage that? So we need to adapt our states, um, our states, so that that actually we're, we we're not going to stop the wind blow events. They're going to happen. We know that the models have already told us all that. But we've got to design the forest better so that we're mitigating for those. We get smaller um, pockets of wind blow uh, rather than catastrophic wind blow. So we've really got to bear this in mind. And it already been mentioned about sort of pests and diseases as well. Um, if we suddenly had a massive wind blow event at the same time as um, we had an increase of certain pests and diseases, then the two together could really have a significant impact on, on our whole ecosystem of, our, of, of management as well. And finally, my final point was just, are we there yet, Mum? And, and my view is, no, we're not there. These are all things that we, we know we've got to do. Gail's document sheds, these are all things you've got to start managing um, as well. Uh, so we're not there. Our corporate plan is, sets out our nice vision up to 2030. Um, will we be there by 2030? No, we won't be there by 2030 either. Um, uh, uh, but what I would say is from an NRW perspective, we've got that tanker and it started to turn. And, and it's going the right direction. I think these are showing that we are going the right direction, but we've got to, we've got to start doing things now. And, and I know that some of my colleagues sort of say, oh, can we have some scientific research that says I can do X? Or can I have a bit of paper that says I can do Y? And, and I'm afraid forestry is not uh, um, black and white. You're not, it's not painting by numbers. You're not gonna get an instruction book that says, this is what you do. And you can't always wait. There's a lot of information. Forest research and the universities have got a lot of information out there that we just need to know where to pull it through and where to um, uh, start acting. And we just need to do it. And the novel species is, is a prime example. Um, yeah, let's just go ahead and do more planting. S uh, follows actually what Sinjin showed with his, his design. Do it, evaluate the results, learn from it, and then do, uh, do something differently if need be. And that's really all I was going to cover on the on the Welsh Government Woodland Estate. I'll stay here. <laughs> all right. Uh, I don't know if you want to set up a. Okay. Right. I'll see how far okay. we can take that. Mm. I can pull you this lead out, can't I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, Greg Jones has asked, why should we be considering um, broadleaf increase with conifer decrease as a measure of success to mitigate uh, climate emergency? Um, uh, if the context of our ancient woodland resources, then that would be an achievement as standalone consideration. Um, is there more to be considered and more to balance? And yes, is the answer to that. So the broad, the broadleaf conifer is just, um, I just put it up for show, Greg. Um, it, it's not really a measure of diversity, but it's uh, structural diversity, but it's, 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 a, it's a tiny measure. It just shows a bit. But you're right, there's a lot. There's, we, we need to find better ways to show how we are delivering um, our structural diversity. Yeah. I don't think so. Uh, I think actually, so uh, what I didn't put on those figures is 20,000 hectares of our of our estate is is ancient woodland high value sites. Um, those ones, we need to sort of perhaps speed up the conversion of the ancient wooden sites um, um, and, and get greater broadleaves back into some of those sites as well. So it's not not I don't say it's a PR sort of thing. Yeah, can Go you mind if I just jump in as well? <clears throat> I think um, uh, we're trying to in increase resilience of the estate as well, uh, and I think broad leaves are part of that. Um, we do a lot of public consultation through our forest resource plans, and the general message from the uh, public when they come to those uh, meetings is they'd like to see more broad leaves. So, not necessarily, I, I challenge that, you know. Uh,
<clears throat> yeah, no, no, it's okay. I think it's interesting, uh, but I, I think what we do need to focus on is this uh, resilient estate. We know that the dependence on, uh, I can't remember the figure, was it 82% Sitka? Yeah, 82% Sitka, but I, I think, to be calm with us, yeah. I think we, we know there's risk in that for us, of, of what could come around the corner. Um, uh, Broadleaves are part of that. I'm not saying that's the, uh, the only thing we should be doing, um, but it, it has to be something different to that uh, Sitka. Sorry, uh, Andrew uh, Sinjin, thank you. Very interesting talks. Um, and I'm afraid I'm going to continue that last point. But I did hear your answer, Sinjin, and I, I take the points you've already made. But you're saying we need, you know, we need to increase the percentage of broad leaves on the NRW estate. We're not going fast enough. And yes, resilience is one of the issues for that. But do you have a clear strategy for what level of broad leaves you want and why you want that level and how does this join up with a need for a strategic reserve of timber and and biomass which is going to provide you with green energy and green construction if you have less productive woodlands so i'm not saying don't do it i'm just saying Where's the plan, uh, which I'm sure you do have? I'm just curious. I think that, the, so we don't have a single plan, a single strategy. We have it built into each of the resource plans. So we've got 70 resource plans um, across all of our state. That's where we actually sort of put out what, what our, our future structure would be. Um, the strategic, the con yeah, we don't have anything that says we must have X amount of conifers. But the, there is a document that Sinjin flagged up on his, his slide. One of the purposes and roles of the Welsh Government Estate is to provide timber. And we will still provide timber. We know that um, you can't have all your eggs in one basket. We've got to diversify um, just, just to reduce that risk aspect. Um, and and that is, the risk aspect is a worry to us. Um, so we know that. But we don't have a target to go for. And we don't sort of say... This is the, the future area. And I also think we've also got to be careful on um, area. Well, um, we, we're, going to get, we're going to get change in, in our, our species. It's also going to result in changing productivity of those species anyway. Changing climate improves, it, but there's also improved, uh, the improved genetic breedings of them, all going to affect. So, so some are going to go and offset the others as well. Yeah, sorry, I just want to contribute to that. And as um, a forestry community, we might remember that broadly trees are trees and they produce timber. 